Hello, good morning, and good afternoon, and good evening for everyone online as well. It's nice seeing so many people in this session. We are starting uh, very shortly. Um, we have still one speaker who is on his way. But I think, uh, Andriette, we, we can start uh, slowly. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jorge Cancio. I work for the Swiss government and uh, I have the pleasure of being co-moderator of this session with uh, Henriette Esterhuisen. So, uh, welcome to this session about the Global Digital Compact, uh, a session organized by the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group of the IGF. And the title of the session is the GDC and beyond a multi-stakeholder perspective. And for this, we have indeed a multi-stakeholder panel with us today. We have Paul Wilson from APNIC, from the technical community, who is coming. I see him there. Hello, Paul. Faster, uh, Paul, faster. I'm sorry, this is perhaps Swiss punctuality or Japanese, of course. Uh, we try to be on time here. And uh, we have uh, Valeria Betancourt from the Association for Progressive Communications, uh, civil society. She comes from a Grulak country. Raul Echevarria from the private sector, also Grulak. Constance Deleuze. Uh, she will joining us uh, virtually um, on video. She's from the Project Liberty Institute Academia, based in a Wiok country. Then we have also the pleasure of having with us Ambassador Bitange Ndemo, Ambassador to Belgium from the Kenyan government, who was very much involved in the excellent IGF of 2011 in Nairobi. And of course, we have the pleasure of having with us um, Amandeep Gill, the Undersecretary General and Envoy for Technology of the UN Secretary General from India. So with this, I think that the session, we will try to have it as interactive as possible. We have broadly structured it in three segments, a segment on the process, a process towards the Global Digital Compact. We are in midst of this process, but still a way to, to come to the outcomes. A second segment about the content of the Global Digital Compact, what will be there in this uh, very important document. And finally, what will come after uh, once the GDC is adopted? What will be the follow-up and the review? And uh, in each segment, we will have statements, short statements, two minutes each from our panelists, and then we will go to the audience, and uh, this will be repeated in each of these three segments, and we will finalize with one minute takeaways from our panelists. So, Anurayit. Thanks very much, Jorge. Um, I don't have much more to add in terms of introduction, and I think the, the GDC is the, the global um, digital compact is not new to us. And I think it's just really worth reflecting on the fact that 
Um, there's been a lot of debate around it. There's been a lot of concern about what it entails for the future of the Internet Governance Forum. Um, there's been some uncertainty about, about where it's heading. But I think on the positive end, I think what we really need to acknowledge and actually celebrate about this process is that it has galvanized this community. It's, it's made the IGF think about its place in the world and where this place is heading. It has... Uh, opened up engagement. The internet governance community has a tendency to become quite insular. And I think the Global Digital Development Compact, uh, Compact and the Summit of the Future process has reminded this community of, of other processes in the world that deal with bigger and broader issues that also intersect with the issues that we deal with. And then I think it has also brought us to the attention and the work that has been done within the Internet Governance Forum, within the national and regional IGF initiatives, um, to the attention of people that were not aware of it. So for me, it actually has been exactly what this community needed to, to give us a sense of waking up, reflecting, and engaging. So I really look forward to, to this panel taking us on that path, providing more clarity, but also being really um, forward-looking on how this, this process can actually strengthen and broaden the, the work that has been done in this space. So we'll go, we'll start. I'm going to start on that end. We're talking about process now. We're going to have these very short interventions from our panel. We'll change the direction, but Paul, can you please open for us? Thank you, thank you, Henriette, and apologies to the to the moderator for uh, <coughs> giving you some anxiety. Um, look, I, I do want to say um, that as governments move into the GDC negotiations, that it's it's just so important uh, not to take the internet for granted, uh, and I mean the stability, uh, the availability, the efficiency, the scalability, uh, everything that we that. Is, is intrinsic to the internet layer, and I'm speaking as a member of the technical community here, so I'm talking about the internet as the layer on which everything else depends. And it is almost invisible, and it is very easy to take it for granted. But um, the thing is, regardless of, of the GDC, of course, whether it's, and what, what the process is, whether it's a multi-stakeholder or multilateral or, or something uh, in between, the internet can only, th only continue to thrive, the internet as we see it and the technical community can only continue to thrive on the continuing cooperation of all of the relevant stakeholders. And without that, there are critical qualities of the internet that are, that are uh, at risk of or will inevitably over time become fragmented or compromised. And I'd like to just remember that, that multi-stakeholder internet governance was not an invention of the WISIS in 2005. It was a discovery by the Working Group on Internet Governance that the multi-stakeholder nature of internet governance was a key and is still a key today to the internet's success. So I'd, I'd like to say that for the GDC to be, to be also successful, it needs to recognise the multi-stakeholder cooperation that has um, been with us for so long, including over the last 20 years while it has been under the microscope, and, and also not take that for granted because the thing is that cooperation of any kind, and particularly not global cooperation as we see it here, it never comes for free. It, uh, it requires work on the part of everyone involved that's costly and it's challenging, uh, and that it can also be fragile, and, uh, and I think it, it absolutely warrants um, recognition in this process, it war warrants encouragement and it, it warrants uh, support. And I really hope that's, that's the goal of, uh, of the GDC, at least in, t in terms of the objectives uh, r related to the internet. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Bitange. Thank you. Um, I think this comes at the right time, and I think everybody by now understands that in internet is very key to our lives. Uh, going through uh, the 
the, through COVID-19, um, we were able to teach throughout that year, which put people aside. We worked with micro enterprises to leverage uh, some of the platforms to do business. So this is a very important space. And uh, GDC comes at the right time to perhaps give government directions with respect to regulation. Uh, we see people rushing to regulate uh, new technologies at the moment. We hope that we can have such discussions through multi-stakeholders to provide uh, the best of regulations, especially in, in AI. Uh, we also need to talk about standards across the world. Um, so um, many things are happening, innovation, young people uh, leveraging digitalization to innovate. We have seen productivity improvements and we need to create a space for conversations to ensure that all this happens as we move forward. I think I would stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Pitange. Um, Raul. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Henriette. Um, uh, first of all, I think that's, uh, that uh, we should recognize and be very happy to see that uh, this has been a central point in the agenda of the Secretary General of the United Nations. So it's, it's, it's very good to see that, that uh, finally the, 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 the topics that we discussed, the, the issues that we discussed here go to the, to the top in the, in the international agenda. And, um, uh, and there has been a consistent path uh, since the, the, the creation of the high-level uh, panel on digital cooperation. So that, that, those are, are very good news. Uh, with regard to the process itself the, uh, of the uh, Global Digital Compact, uh, I feel really that, that, the, that we could have contributed more and better. And there probably, is, and it shows the complexity and the difficulty of organizing a, a really global and inclusive uh, process. That the war is very big, and the diversity is uh, is also very, very, very big. And I had the, the the feeling that we could have had more consultations, probably through more partners in, involving more people, because uh, a Mandip team cannot do everything. But uh, but uh, uh, maybe we could have organized more. Or, uh, uh, events, consultations at the regional level involving more people. I feel that there is a large part of the community that is, uh, I'm, I come from private sector, so the small companies, small private sector associations that are, are not aware of what is happening. And in fact, I, I was in, uh, in Montevideo, in Uruguay, uh, two weeks ago in a, in a global summit of uh, parliamentarians. Uh, um, some of them mentioned the Global Digital Compact and the Tekken Boy and and other things, but I realized that the majority of the people uh, in, uh, were, uh, were not aware of, uh, of the processes. And I don't know how to fix it at this point, but it's just uh, speaking about the process, I feel, I have that feeling that we could have contributed more than that. And with regard, my final point, with regard to, regard to private sector, is a, is a highly diverse uh, constituency because the, the, there are diversity of interest, diversity of uh, sectors, but also diversity of sizes of companies and the regional origins. So it is difficult to involve everybody and we have to work more on that. So. Thanks, Raul. Valeria. Thank you very much, Andriette. And I want to use this opportunity to bring up some of the issues that civil society organizations, including the one that I am part of, have identified as critical in regards to the process. The aspirations of the Global Digital Compact as an opportunity to strengthen in the multi-stakeholder approach have faded. This aspiration had to do with building and expanding on the principles adopted by the WSIS in terms of multi-stakeholder participation, acknowledging that multilateral and multi-stakeholder global digital governance are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and that uh, both are really necessary to respond to the different and distributed ways and spaces in which global digital governance is undertaken. So, so far, the trend has been the lack of timely information provision for a meaningful engagement and participation of civil society actors, including clarity on what the whole process is aiming at 
what the, form and, uh, the format and outcome will be, and how the input provided through the regional and global consultations, the call for contributions, and the deep dives will continue to be used. Humanity and the planet are experiencing the social and economic impacts of a global pandemic, resulting in emerging and exacerbated structural inequality and injustice and overlapping crisis, including the unprecedented climate emergency. The expectation was that the Global Digital Compact would establish clear linkages with other existing and ongoing processes and spaces in the midst of a rapidly changing context in which the scope of internet-related public policy issues keeps expanding and the separation of digital from non-digital is diffuse. So no open, free, and secure digital future for all can be shaped by excluding the voices and realities of the most affected by digitalization of all aspects of life and allowing the predominance of interest oriented to keep the status quo. The GDC could replicate the model of the, WCS, the WSIS Plus 10 review, in which the primary participants were governments, of course, in accordance to its intergovernmental character, but which also allowed the possibility of effective and real engagement of other stakeholders in the preparatory and negotiation process. Inclusion should be the norm, not the opposite, not the contrary. Thanks, Valeria. I'm Amdeep. As usual, you're the one that has to be put on the spot. Thank you, thank you very much, Anriet. And uh, I think Valeria has set it up very nicely for me. I like this reference to the non-digital challenges that we face. And in fact, the GDC is not a standalone uh, product or a process. It's part of the highway to the summit of the future where there are these different tracks on those urgent non-digital issues. Uh, the debt crisis, uh, the need for reform of the global financial architecture, the need to progress on the SDGs, uh, the need to build new frameworks for uh, peace, the new agenda for peace tracks. So the GDC should be seen as part of those that larger picture, and it indeed is coming out of the our common agenda report, where this is just one of the 12 important areas uh, that are mentioned uh, for the international community uh, to rally around. Now, the second thing I want to say is that we've just come through the first phase of the process, and that was the consultations phase. And within the limitations of time and resources, uh, you know, I have a very small team with a very small budget. I think the team has done a phenomenal job. The co-facilitators have done a phenomenal job of getting more than 7,000 entities to contribute inputs, not only those eight thematic deep dives and other consultations in New York, but also consultations in Geneva, in many other places, regional consultations in Africa, Latin America, and uh, in Asia. And that continues. I mean, uh, later this week, there'll be a consultation in uh, Korea, in Seoul, for the Asia-Pacific region. So we will keep that up, that inclusive, open process of consultations, listening in, reflecting what is happening inside the room, that will uh, continue. So in many ways, as you've seen in the Secretary General's statement and in the policy brief on the Global Digital Compact, this is an opportunity to also push the multi-stakeholder paradigm into new areas, new venues, and enhance participation. You know, in, in a sense, I mean, there is some method to this madness. I mean, you look back at the high-level panel on digital cooperation. This is programmed inflammation. One of my yoga teachers talks about programmed inflammation. So you need to kind of get, if you want to get the ecosystem to the next, next level, because tech is not waiting, the challenges are not waiting they are multiplying exponentially. So we need to take the ecosystem to the next level of agility, dynamism, responsiveness. So the Secretary General's vision on digital cooperation is inspired by that. So this is the next level of programmed inflammation. So obviously when you are pushed 
to grow, there is, you know, from the body and the mind, there is some lethargy, there's some resistance. And I think this is where some of the kind of, you know, sometimes, oh, mm -hmm. what is happening? Where are we going, etc. Those kind of questions come. But uh, stay tuned in, participate as you've been doing in a fantastic manner. Adis Ababa helped inform the consultation process. And starting with this IJF, we are going to be informing the negotiation phase. I'm glad to see uh, the Ambassador of Rwanda join us with his team. So the co-facilitators would appreciate your active engagement going forward. Thanks very much, um, Imam Deep. And thanks everyone for mostly keeping to the, to the time limit. Our, our f um, final speaker, Constance Bomlar de Luz, is not with us. So I think, Jorge, we can go ahead and get input from the audience. That's great. Yes, we, as we said at the, at the beginning, we're trying to, to have this session as interactive as possible and not waiting for the audience at the end of the session. So we have the privilege of counting now with uh, the intervention from Ms. Agnes Vachukivechute, I'm sorry for <laughs> the pronunciation, Deputy Minister of Transport and Communications from Lithuania. The floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. It was uh, very interesting to listen to all the speeches. I think we all have the same goal for the future of internet. And I would like to intervene on behalf of the Eurodic stakeholders community, which has been engaged throughout the United Nations Secretary General's process on digital cooperation. It is important now for the final stages of the negotiations on the Global Digital Compact in the United Nations to continue to be open to multi stakeholder contributions. I think all the panelists agreed on this approach. Following the summit of the future next year, the IGF should have a central role in the implementation of the Compact's principles and commitments to action for achieving an open, free, inclusive, secure, and sustainable digital future for all. I had a fruitful discussions with the Eurodix community in Vilnius and here in Japan in, uh, in IGF. So I can confirm they stand ready to provide an European channel for further stakeholder inputs. So I'm very proud to announce and invite all of you to participate in Eurodig, uh, which will take place next June in Vilnius, Lithuania. And I hope that the next year, and um, as colleagues mentioned, um, this is only the first step. So I think from the audience and all the panelists, uh, uh, the fry is to know more about the whole process and steps ahead. And I hope that the discussions and negotiations for the next year will be very fruitful and uh, we will come up uh, with a future of internet we want, we all want. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for that input, for those thoughts and for being on time. Um, we have four mics here and in the good IGF tradition, you can line up and speak. We have time for three or four perhaps speakers. You have two minutes. Please share your thoughts. I see the gentleman. And introduce yourself. Yes, please. Uh, this is Aysam Bozlur Rahman. I come from Bangladesh uh, Internet Governance Forum. We have been involved with the Global Digital Compact process from the beginning. And we have already participated in the deep dive under the leadership of uh, UN Tech. Thank you very much for uh, involve us. But uh, last uh, preparatory meeting of the summit of the future, there is no civil society space. So I would appreciate if you could allow us, if you could uh, uh, provide some spaces for the civil society voices from the country level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is a direct input. And I see Gentlemen there, Jordan Carter, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Good morning, everyone. Jordan Carter from the .au Domain Administration, uh, speaking personally. Um, I agree with the uh, comments about the need to be innovative in these processes. And I think that the multi-stakeholder internet governance community has a lot of benefit it can add. 
but it shouldn't just be seen as offering input on a consultation basis. I think the UN system needs to consider innovations that it can deliver to the negotiation process as well. And not just, again, consultation, but active engagement and involvement. I know, given the nature of the UN and the multilateral system, that that is a big thing to ask. But I think if we have a genuine belief that internet and digital governance happens best by genuinely involving the stakeholders, not only to hear their points of view, but to help genuinely shape the decisions by being in the room, that is an innovation that could be done. And it isn't necessarily an innovation because it's been done before in the WISIS context and in other contexts. So my urging to everyone involved, to all of the representatives, particularly of member state governments who are here, because you are the key players in the UN system, is to take some innovations into this process itself to shift the dial from consulting us to involving us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan. And as a government representative, I take note of that, of course. Um, don't be shy. Come forward to, to the mic. But, of course, uh, is there any intervention perhaps online? Henriette is multitasking so well. Um, total support for the comments from, from, from Jordan Carter. Um, I mean, I think I'll just add, and, and, and maybe a question for the panelists when they respond to this, is that are we perhaps also underestimating the complexity of two very different forms of governance, both of which are imperfect in their own ways, and both which require a fair amount of evolution and improvement, multilateral and multi-stakeholder, that we need to get them to engage and be more, more complementary. And maybe we're still in the phase where we're kind of head bashing, and we still need to move towards the innovation that Jordan was talking about. Um, is there an online comment? Nena Nwakanma has a hand. Um, can she be unmuted, please? She wants to speak. Nena, please go ahead. She's still muted. Nena, you could, un you could type your question if you wanted to. And then we could, um, I don't have Hello, hosting everyone. permit. Great, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Henriette, and hello, everyone. Um, just a quick one. As we go into the negotiation phase, we do understand that this is mainly governmental. And like someone has said, we would love for it to be more than that. However, my submission would be that regular updates on these negotiations need to be made public um, so that we can follow. And the reason I'm saying is, is that I am participating in Kyoto online. And while we might be happy with negotiations, that will happen in New York. It is very important that GDC recognizes that the greater part of the GDC community are neither in New York uh, nor online and may need to follow things in other ways. So my submission will be that while negotiations are going on, the, the summaries will be regularly updated on the site of the UN Tech Envoy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nena. And I, I think we have to keep moving because uh, we have covered the timing for the first segment. But thank you so much for those interventions. I think... Can, uh, Jorge, I just yes. want to read one short okay, question sure. um, from Fiona Alexander. Um, what changes can we see in the process going forward? Okay, good question. Perhaps... It's something that panelists may weave in in their next statements. Raul, do you have a short intervention to that? Okay. Yes, uh, I think that's a 
what uh, what Jordan says uh, is very important about the the, the kind of the, of participation and involvement, and this is I I don't doubt that the, there were uh, thousands of contributions. In fact, I participated in some contributions, and there were several governments working hard in organizing the the, the consultations. But uh, clearly, we it's clear that we feel in this community more comfortable with this kind of uh, of sessions and formats of consultations than just uh, submitting comments. And uh, um, I think that's what uh, what Fiona says is, uh, and also Nana is is, is crucial that that uh, toward the, the 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 summit of the future we have opportunities to participate for non-governmental stakeholders in the in the process as we did, or even better than we did in uh, in 2005 uh, for the for which is, uh, uh, we would expect that we could improve the the process and innovate in that sense. Thank you so much. I will maybe short reaction. Yes, so several uh, good comments, and I loved the point about um, building on the innovations that are already there uh, on multi-stakeholder participation, that, you know, this kind of how do we square uh, this circle between multilateral processes and multi-stakeholder, not just participation, but uh, deeper engagement. We don't have the perfect answer anywhere, so uh, I'm a student of international learning in a historical sense. We really don't have a, a perfect answer, but we have innovations out there. The cyber crime treaty negotiations, the negotiations involving the chemical industry recently that UN, UNEP facilitated, uh, and the negotiations, even on difficult, sensitive issues like lethal autonomous weapon systems, where, you know, with some inventiveness, you found a way to bring in experts um, into uh, the discussions. So the co-facilitators are here and they are listening uh, to all these suggestions. And I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, working with member states, they would find a way to make sure that this is um, as open, as inclusive, as engaging as possible. Uh, Nena made this point about briefings. So intercessional engagement with different stakeholders has been a part of the approach that's been adopted during the cybercrime treaty uh, negotiations. So I would like to add, in addition to the suggestion that we've heard, I'd like to urge you also to work with uh, the member states that you live in, that you work with, so that you can get into the delegations, get to engage the delegations more, particularly the delegations uh, in New York and in Geneva. So we have to work at this problem from several angles. It is, there's no magic uh, fix uh, to, uh, to this. Amandeep. This is a, a great segue to, to the next part of uh, our conversation. And as you said uh, before, and as we commented, we are at the midst of this process, more or less. We have seen a policy brief, and recently we have seen the issues paper, a very summarized uh, version of uh, what the deep dives and the many consultations have uh, brought on the table from the perspective of the co-facilitators. So perhaps, and of course this is a provisional state of the situation, uh, what would be your point of view, uh, of you panelists, of uh, what is worthwhile having in the GDC, uh, what is still lacking, what uh, could be innovations to bring really added value, a new substance into this uh, global framework on digital cooperation. And maybe, if I may, uh, I would start with you, Amandeep, and you can give us. Of course, the issues um, in the digital universe are uh, many, many and uh, you had to organize them, and I think that those eight issues um, are a nice way of organizing the substance. Uh, and there has been in the inputs, in the commentaries, etc. cetera, and there have been suggestions, how do you tweak this? Perhaps we need a greater emphasis on the digital economy, uh, the kind of data for development, digital for development issues that are 
emerging rapidly. Uh, AI already finds a good place in those um, um, in in the current structuring of issues. Again, there is an upsurge of interest, and I'm sure there is some time before the negotiation phase starts. Plenty of time for the co-facilitators and their teams to think about uh, how to organize for the uh, next phase. I don't think there is anything missing. It's just a question of emphasis. If you look at the Secretary General's policy brief, um, again, this was a challenge for us across the UN system, all the UN entities working to help the Secretary General prepare that policy brief. How do we uh, bring it down to a solid vision? How do we structure that vision? So this threefold framing, uh, bridging the digital divide, accelerating progress on the SDGs. Second, addressing the harms online, protecting and promoting human rights, uh, digital trust and security type of issues. And third, the governance side of it, uh, the agile governance, the responsive governance side of it, with particular reference to AI. So that was one way to kind of bring it all together to a strategic uh, level. And then those different action areas, they followed the co-facilitators leads, uh, a lead in terms of you know, the structuring of the issues, uh, principles, objectives, and example actions under those objectives. Because it will not be enough to have only principles. We have a surfeit of principles in the digital domain. We need to move to action frameworks, to commitments, and a way to follow up on those commitments. Uh, that is the, the potential for value addition from the Global uh, Digital Compact. Thank you so much, Amandeep. So we have more flesh on the bones and uh, more flesh to react on. Valeria? Thank you, Jorge. Well, global digital cooperation is at a crossroads. The gains of connectivity are uneven, and digital exclusion, including the gender digital gap, are preventing many to embrace the benefits of the digital revolution. So social and economic injustice and inequality presents an urgent challenge to development and democracy. So if the, if the Agenda 2030 is to be realized. And if the Global Digital Compact is meant to contribute to it, bold and commit, committed actions are needed to first take the benefits of digitalization to all countries and people. Second, govern digital resources in a transparent, inclusive, and accountable manner protecting the public core of the internet. And third, make digital policies and law fit for catalyzing innovation that counts. We need definitely a paradigm shift, one that addresses digital inequality paradox. As more people are connected, digital inequality is amplified as all technologies converge into the larger phenomenon of digitalization, the threat that the digital revolution bypasses developing countries becomes more real. So this is, this is not just about access to the internet, it is about the complex issues of quality of such access, affordability, and equal participation of countries in the global regime that set the rules of the game. And for people everywhere to have the the skills, the skills to reap the opportunities of this paradigm. So it is paramount to understand that we have to bridge the gap between those who have technological and financial resources to use the internet uh, and other digital technologies to transact, to prosper, to contribute to wealth of nations and others who don't. So the, power, the powerful countries use free trade agreements to stifle digital rights of peoples and countries in the Global South in particular. So trade rules are used to arm twist governments to hyper-liberalize data flows, take away local autonomy of public authorities to govern transnational corporations and their algorithms prevent the scrutiny of source code, and legitimize a permanent dependence of the developing countries on the monopoly corporations controlling data and AI power. So this kind of infrastructural dependence is equivalent to a neo-colonial extractivist order. Uh, the unfinished 
business of the WSIS cannot be forgotten. And the challenges that have emerged in the last two decades have to be addressed by the Global Digital Compact. It, it is really necessary to enable political, regulatory, technical, technological, and financial conditions to increase the individual and collective agency and autonomy and choice of people to connect to digital technology and spaces, as well as how they use, shape, inform, and create them once they are connected. A realistic approach Valeria. to do so is one based on human rights, intersectional and feminist frameworks to address the geopolitics of global inequality and injustice. The, con the conclusive test for well-guided digital transition is in the public, collective, and social value it can create and the human freedoms that Thank it you, can Valeria. expand. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but we have to keep on time. Thank you very much for those thoughts. And uh, Raul, what's your take? Thank you, uh, Jorge. Um, um, I think that's the, the issues paper that was uh, uh, um, is, uh, shared very recently is a, is a good collection of, of the of the points that the, that uh, had to be in the in the global digital compact. Uh, so it, and it is very interesting to see that the similarities uh, between the list of, of issues and the and the topics that are central for the agenda of IGF. So it means. Between brackets, it means that IGF is a is a very valid and valuable venue to to discuss the, the, those those issues. Uh, what I would hope from uh, what I would expect from the GDC that I, I expect um, uh, emphasize uh, a positive emphasize in, in relation with technology. That's the the technology evolution will not stop, and we need the the the, the, the humankind to embrace the the technology evolution in a positive manner. So the, uh, I would expect to have a message of hope and, and, and a call to speed up innovation in every, in, in every country around the, the, the world and, and to, to work in, 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 uh, hard to, to really achieve that, that uh, technologies uh, help to have a more equitable development uh, across the globe. And, um, and that the benefits of the, the technology evolution uh, uh, is uh, reached to uh, uh, everybody in the world. And, and so it could not be a, a just a regulatory approach or over-regulatory approach uh, to, the, to the technologies. This is what uh, I, I would expect. And I think that the, the, the message from the Prime Minister of Japan yesterday was very inspiring in that sense. And he said uh, something, I, I don't want to quote the Prime Minister, but uh, he said something like, "We cannot ignore the problems that that, that we have, but uh, but uh, uh, we can optimize the benefits of technology, reducing the risk, something like that." Uh, and so I think that this is very inspiring, and this is the direction that the CDC should have, uh, trying to to bring a, a, a really a, a hope for the, for humankind that's uh, and a positive. We cannot just we cannot uh, try to stop the, the technology evolution, but we have to work to make that evolution, the, the technology evolution is good for everybody in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raul. Very important thoughts. It's really the task or one of the tasks of our time to, to really find that balance. Now, Bitange, what's your view on this? Yeah, I would explain this by giving just two examples, um, in 2007, um, the, the, one of the operators was looking for approval to allow digital money, and that was what we call M-Pesa now. And we, we thought about it, there were, there were too many spaces, government was fearing, but eventually took the risk and M-Pesa went through a lot of uh, inclusivity now when people talk in retrospect. If we can be able to understand here that uh, innovation precedes regulation because what I'm seeing now with the prospect of AI is that people want to regulate before we are out there to do innovations. Having been a teacher for many years, and having seen some of the applications in AI, in education, uh, some of us grew through the theories of Plato, 
the philosophies of Plato, where children had to memorize everything, and you come to get shocked what you memorize that is so, it's a theory that you needed to understand a couple of years ago. Pro there are so many problems in education. Uh, one that I can, everybody can relate to, that if you mark 30 essays, you are, and, and you give it to 10 other people, uh, they would all make mistakes. But with the new technologies, such problems would go. If we can make sure that uh, either we agree universally that uh, we allow the innovations to take place, that, that we can be able to see in this period of augmentation, especially in education, we could do much more to the world uh, than just coming out and saying uh, the propaganda about AI, it is bad, it's going to take human beings and stuff. Um, that's what I can say about this. Thank you so much, Pitange. Of course, education is one of, one of the basic pillars of, also of this digital world. Paul, what's your take? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, think, I think the uh, GDC needs to uh, truly acknowledge uh, what, where we are and what we have already and, and build from here. Um, I mean, one of the objectives of the GDC is an open, is an inclusive, open, secure and shared internet, but we still have 33% of people still to connect. Um, and I'd say out of the 70, the, the 66 connected, um, a lot who still need what we call meaningful internet connectivity. And it means we're still in growth. We're still in, in growth of connectivity and accessibility and content and capability of the internet. And so the growth pains of the last 20 years that we've all felt that we've all responded to, that this whole process is aiming to address, these growth pains are going to continue with building capacity and infrastructure and integrity and security. They're going to continue and, and, and require our cooperation. And uh, people have asked me, uh, why are we still talking about internet governance? And the, the answer is because the internet is, is changing and growing and new challenges are, are coming along uh, constantly. Uh, we've got, um, and we've got incredible uh, innovations so far, famously across the internet, but also in this room and in this, in this process. And so I really think that while we're in growth, we need to continue to, uh, to use and build on those, um, those innovations not to um, rearrange the, the sort of the deck chairs uh, wantonly or to, um, or, to, uh, or to simply overlook what, what, we've, what we've got. I think we need to continue the work of bringing benef benefits to the, of the internet to more people and urgently. Um, and so out of, um, out of respect for all of the work that's been done and recognition for all of the work that's been done, but also for the sake of sheer efficiency and the urgency of, of let's say, of overcoming the the non, the digital issues and, and paying attention to the non-digital issues that Valeria has mentioned. We we um, let's uh, let's recognise this and build on it. Thanks. Thank you so much. I see that Vitanga has an urgent reaction to that. I think he raises a good point. If, even if we had 100% coverage of internet globally, still. Um, a good percentage of people would not be able to be on the internet simply because of language. And uh, AI has come, all these LLMs, we need to enable these people through their local languages to be able to do something online. That is what I can call inclusivity. Thank you so much, Pitange. Andriette. We have, um, I, my apologies if I look like I've been on my screen. I've been having connectivity issues, believe it or not. Um, but so apologies to online participants if I've missed your questions. But we have a hand from Umar Farouk. Umar, do you want to um, speak? I'm trying to unmute you here. Um, I've lost my connection again. So can, can um, the the... Can you unmute him, please? Um, I'm Rita. And Umar, just briefly introduce yourself and keep your intervention short. Um, 
Is there another question? I'm Rita, just switch on your mic and please read the questions. And to our tech team over there, I'm afraid I can't unmute people because my connection keeps dropping. Do you not? Thank you, thank you, I'm Rita. Sorry about that. So this is a question from Jyoti Pandey. She asks, what is the mechanism to include stakeholders in the scenario of member states not being inclusive or not wanting to work with critical voices? Thanks for that. And I see Omar still has his hand up, and I cannot unmute him. Thanks a lot, Amrita. Um, but shall we take another question in the meantime? Over there, Nigel, and introduce yourself, and then we'll move over here. And I had a bet with Jorge that there'll be more people coming to the mics when I'm moderating the open segment. So please help me win that bet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nigel Casimir from the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, which is a, an intergovernmental organization of 20 member states and territories in the Caribbean. And uh, we are following the processes of the GDC development on behalf of the, the Caribbean, our, our member states, essentially. However, we being generally small island developing states, that's the kind of perspective that we are bringing in, into the discussion. And um, we've heard many of the panelists talk about um, people who may be not even aware of the process of, of GDC, the need for inclusion. Um, we still have a third of persons not yet connected, and a lot of those persons and people who are not aware are in like small island developing states and, and, and others. So I'm wondering if there is a special, any special effort being made to involve them. I mean, it certainly is our challenge, and we are taking up the challenge even here at this at this um, IGF, we have a, a forum on it on, on, on Thursday, but I'm wondering to what extent in the development of the GDC, the, the, what, what efforts are being made to reach these specific ones, these specific types of, of countries and uh, to get their inputs and to make sure that they, that they are appropriately taken account of. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Um, Stella, we'll go to you, our youth representative. Just introduce yourself. Right. Thank you, everyone. So my name is Stella, and I was in charge of the GDC submission with netmission.asia under .asia. So I just have a question for the panelists. So youth often touted as the future, but I feel like we need to be present, and we have been, we've seen a lot of youth initiatives submitting to the GDC mm -hmm. through the online, the open consultation. So your thoughts on uh, how the youth can continue to be involved, especially in the review process after we've already submitted our uh, initial submissions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Eric, we'll go over to you first. Um, hello, I'm Eric Huerta from Rizomatica. Uh, well, my question is regarding um, the process. I was remembering the process for WISIS that um, indigenous peoples were um, actively participated in the in the process. Uh, also, most of the um, uh, meetings um, from for indigenous uh, communities were auspiced by the government of Canada, I remember well. So um, in this process of um, how um, indigenous uh, peoples are uh, being involved and incorporated, especially considering that uh, most of the challenges that you have mentioned are affecting uh, particularly for them. Thanks, and let's go to our online speaker, Omar, now. Um, Amrita, is, is, is he ready? And then we'll go to Emma over here. Yeah, so hello. My yes, name we is can hear you. Uh, Good. Finally. Thank you. Uh, so hello, my name is Omar Farooq, a 17-year-old boy from Bangladesh, and I'm the founder and president of Project Omna. So I was the youngest and only child panelist of every global digital complex sessions, representing children globally and provided statements on uh, every thematic discussion. So, my question, uh, question is that, uh, uh, my first question is that uh, I am concerned that the GDC uh, doesn't adequately address the following challenges in the uh, policy brief and the issues paper prepared by the co-facilitators of the GDC. So the first question is the GDC should uh, introduce uh, substantive developments on how to bridge 
the digital divide and ensure that all children and young people have access to quality uh, digital technologies and connectivity because it's really important that the future uh, the future as, as the children and youth are the future so we must uh, ensure their uh, connectivity and access to digital technologies and then additionally uh, my uh, another uh, uh, topic is that the gdc should uh, introduce substantive developments on how to hold the private sectors accountable for its role in the digital world and ensure that it protects the rights and interests mm -hmm. uh, of children and young people. So thank you to the Young, uh, young Tech Envoy for giving me the opportunity to represent children and youth globally. Thanks, Omar. Um, we're going to close the queue now, so no one else come forward to the mics. Emma, over here. Hello, I'm Emma Gibson from the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights, or Audrey for short. And alongside other organisations, we've been consulting women and people of diverse genders and sexualities all year about what they think should be in a global well, digital compact so that it works um, for them. And essentially what they've been saying to us is that the principles of the GDC that incura, ensure an open, free and secure digital future need to be infused with a feminist and intersectional um, approach um, if um, we're going to ensure a gender just world. Um, so we've come up with a set of 10 principles which we launched on Saturday at a conference. You can stop and ask me for a copy. Um, and um, a feminist GDC would work for everybody. Um, and this includes making sure that the GDC is rooted in existing human rights law, that it's protecting people from multiple, um, people facing multiple forms of discrimination, um, that it ensures freedom from gender-based violence online, which is something we were disappointed wasn't in the, um, the write-up of the deep dives, um, alongside freedom of expression, which we were also concerned was, was missing from that write-up as well. Um, Another principle is obviously ensuring internet access for all, um, dealing with harmful surveillance. Um, we want to expand women's participation in leadership in the tech centre and in policy making. Um, we need to reduce the environmental impact of new technology. The GDC needs to ensure data privacy and adopt equality by design principles for algorithms and digital tech development. And finally, the GDC needs to set safeguards to prevent discriminatory biases. Um, when we launched this um, set of principles on Saturday um, to a, a variety of governments from around the world, and one government suggested that gender equality and feminism should be a, an additional pillar um, of the global dig digital compact. So T I would time's really, up, Emma. Sorry. So I'd really like to ask the mm -hmm. panel for their thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And apologies, I do have to interrupt people. Okay, we'll have this person over here who's still scribbling her notes. <laughs> sorry, is I it was, Liz? Yes, I was adding some points. Introduce yourself. She was speaking. Okay, my name is Liz Arembo from Research ICT Africa. And we've made two submissions to the GDC process. Uh, these two submissions, uh, when we've uh, developed them, we've consulted African stakeholders, uh, some who are in this room and some who are not able to join us. Um, the things that were pertinent in those two consultations were to do with multi-stakeholderism, which I'm not going to talk about because it's been talk talked about enough, and uh, intersectionality there digital inequality paradox that Valeria has talked about. And I'd just like to add that um, with the people who are mostly disadvantaged at multiple uh, sectors of inequalities, those are the people that we actually need uh, to, to take into account with this new GDC process. And uh, what you're saying is that uh, not just even issues of access, but even quality of access. Uh, where people are, dip, um, are accessing technologies differently in terms of gender, where they're placed, uh, economic issues, and all that. So with that, we also, we also put a solution, uh, things to do with the data, uh, data access uh, uh, or data, measuring data on uh, digital inequality paradox itself to actually redress this problem. And with that, we also talk about uh, the power uh, dependency of, uh, of data when it comes to the position of Africa. Uh, 
how are we accessing our own data? Uh, that's to do with also government, also health data, working with government, and also the position of Africa being that uh, we are users of technology and we also don't get access to this data. So how do we get to measure uh, that digital access to actually take care of this digital inequality paradox? Time. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Alisa. Thank you. My name is Elisa Hever, and I'm from the Dutch government, and I'm a MAG member. Um, the policy brief touches upon many important topics, though we are here today in Kyoto, and in exactly this building, um, the Kyoto Protocol um, was negotiated. Um, it was the first time that we internationally agreed upon um, uh, acting for, sustainable, for an, a sustainable environment. The energy consumption keeps on rising for the use of the internet to connect all the people that still need to be connected, but also to have a faster internet and less lat latency. Um, the policy brief only mentions in one bullet to develop uh, environmental sustainability by design and globally harmonized digital sta uh, sustainability standards to safeguards uh, to protect the planet. It doesn't mention the energy consumption of the internet. Um, at least I couldn't find it. Um, however, in my opinion, we need to put more attention to this topic. Um, for us to have a sustainable planet, we also need to decrease the amount of energy that we use uh, on the internet. Thank you. Thanks, Alisa. And our final contribution. Hello, everyone. There's one more there, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm Alexandre Costa Barbosa. I'm a coordinator of the Bra Brazilian Homeless Workers Movement Technology Sector. It's the largest housing movement, social movement worldwide. It's standing for 30,000 people. We, we have been doing in practice most of the GDC is claiming for. We, we've been teaching public, uh, in public schools digital literacy, digital technology uh, education. We've been installing Wi Fi, public Wi Fi hotspots in the, in the poorest regions. Uh, in solidary kitchens. We've been developing ourselves platforms with democratic and cooperative based uh, platform governance to generate income for the last mile. So that's uh, precisely what it's including everyone on digital technologies, as uh, Raul mentioned. So my question, it's, it's something that it's really somehow neglected in IGF's agenda, which is the labor topic. Uh, but it's, it's, in, it's in the policy brief of the DDC. It's, it's clear there. How can we share labor rights, right? So uh, I'd like to hear how, uh, in the process until the summit of the future, can we, we really ensure uh, fostering SDG number eight? It's not only economic growth, it's also decent work. How can we really ensure the participation of unions and other labor organizations in the development of it? Thank you very much. Thanks. And the last contribution from over there. Sorry, Jeanette, the mic has been closed, but we might, we'll, open, we'll try to open once more. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Nermeen Selim, uh, the Secretary General of Creators Union of Arab, ECASA Consultative Estate. Uh, thank you very much for all members of Honorable Stage. It's uh, just a comment, not uh, a point of view, not uh, a question. Allow me to add a point of view. I believe that one of the goals of the Global Digital Compact is to provide a safe digital environment for everyone. But I believe that it must include children from an early age in particular to protect them from electronic blackmail and violation of privacy. Therefore, we as a civil society organization contributed to this matter by adopting the initiative of one of our academic members who prepared a curriculum of digital safety and cybersecurity to provide a safe digital environment. So to know about this curriculum of digital safety and cybersecurity, 
We have a presentation on 12th of uh, this. Do you have a uh, question this. for the panel? No, it's just point of view to make, uh, to provide uh, our curriculum of uh, cybersecurity and digital safety for children to be uh, as a part of the goals of uh, digital uh, global compact. So uh, we invite you to take uh, uh, as an uh, idea about this curriculum to be generalized in all institutions a large number of, of an institution that can uh, take this curriculum. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Thanks, and, and people can grab you. And I want to urge people when they take the microphone to ask a question um, of the panel. So um, apologies that we couldn't take more, but we'll try and open once more. I think we don't have enough time for you to respond and then to go into your um, um, the final segment of our session today, which is looking at the going forward, what comes after the, the GDC process. So I'm going to ask you to respond to the questions we've had on content. Um, and I'm going to add just one question um, to that, which is, you know, we've, we've looked a lot at the content of the GDC. Have we looked enough at the proposed content of the summit of the future? Um, and is there perhaps a little gap here in how we as a community working with digital um, looks at our input at not just being focused on the GDC, but also other aspects of the summit of the future, such as the global agenda for peace. But um, so the panel, let's start again. Um, shall we start with Amamdeep? I think it's your turn to start now. Um, looking forward, post-GDC process, um, review mechanisms, what do you think can we do? How can we be innovative? But also if you can make some responses to the questions from the floor. Thank you. There were many, many questions, so I think we would take a long time to answer mm -hmm. all of them. But let me just try and group them into uh, three categories. One is the, uh, some of the specific interest groups, uh, children, uh, whether it is the small island developing states. So, uh, and that point is well taken. In fact, many of the engagements have been around those kind of themes. Youth, for instance, uh, working with the Secretary General's uh, Youth Envoy, we've uh, put together some consultations. And Amur Omar, who spoke earlier, he's been, you know, he's iconic in terms of youth participation in the uh, GDC deep dives. Um, the issues of sustainability and gender, uh, if you look carefully at the issues paper, you know, at the end of those thematic issues, the co-facilitators have very carefully articulated why those are cross-cutting strategic issues. So, um, Emma, you know, I was happy to join you on Saturday and you heard me speak about how uh, the mainstreaming of gender on digital issues is an important goal for the Secretary General. And it's, you should not only look at the GDC process, but what's happening around it. This year's Commission uh, on the Status of Women, CSW 67, was an exciting opportunity because the theme was around uh, digital and technology. We were able to make a lot of progress and that is going to have its own impact on the GDC um, uh, process. Now, your point um, coming to uh, this uh, aspect of moving forward, and I think that also featured in some of the questions, uh, the, process-related questions. And I love the title of this panel, GDC and Beyond, uh, because uh, we need to think about how do we um, take the GDC forward. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, if the ecosystem is going to, hopefully, um, we, we have to have an ambitious outcome. So if it goes to the next level, then how do we make sure that it stays at that level and that we are organized in a multi-stakeholder fashion to uh, follow up? So the Secretary General has presented some thoughts on that in his policy brief. They are meant to um, stimulate debate and discussion when the uh, process uh, resumes. I think the essential point, the fundamental point which he made in his uh, remarks yesterday is that we need to pull things together in a better way. We need to make sure that we don't again retreat into silos. Um, and we need to make sure 
that there is accountability. That term came up in one of the questions. Accountability of the governments of the private sector uh, in terms of uh, the kind of digital future uh, that we want. So that debate is going to be interesting and exciting. It's also going to be a little challenging. Uh, it's part of that programmed inflammation uh, paradigm and uh, I think Paul you also started to kind of talk a little bit to, uh, to that uh, uh, because we can't really rest on our oars. The internet is growing, the user base is growing, it's shifting, the data flows, if you look at where, what's the the quantum of data flows around the world. So you have new players, you know, the majority of data flows are happening in uh, non-West European, non-North American contexts, starting very recently. So th this, how does the system adjust to these challenges, the advent of AI, and in the future, perhaps ambient computing? So these are kind of interesting questions, and we need to make sure that we have agile frameworks, we have updated frameworks. And in that sense, again, VSIS plus 20 would be another opportunity to make sure that the ecosystem keeps up with the, the challenges. And we are able to handle this enhanced participation from across the globe uh, in our existing uh, forums and make sure that it's meaningful participation. Governments and the private sector give it importance, land up, engage with other uh, stakeholders, the tech community, civil society, academia, uh, and researchers and uh, help us uh, to address the challenges in real time. Thanks, and I know Amandeep went over time, but there were lots of questions to respond to, so, but I do want to ask people to, to keep to time. Valeria, do you have? Is it on? Okay. Very briefly, in terms of the follow-up and review mechanisms, uh, I think that the Human Rights Charter and the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights should be the basis for assessing a stakeholder's commitment with an open, free, and secure digital future. So any review mechanism should be related to existing processes, such as the Universal Periodic Review, the Sustainable Developing Goals, the reporting system around those, the review of the implementation of the, of the WSIS action lines, among others. It should also take into account existing instruments and frameworks, such as the UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators, that also applies to other tracks of the Summit of the Future, because all of them have uh, digital-related components. So in order to be implemented, the Global Digital Compact uh, has to put in place financial mechanisms and reinforce the commitment for the development of digital infrastructure, skills, but also regulatory capacities for all countries to navigate the terrain. We need new commitments for the international financial institutions in the form of reparation for all the data that has been appropriated from people and their interactions from nature and also from common heritage, including indigenous knowledge, as someone from the audience referred earlier. Uh, in addition, taxing big tech for global and national financing is a must if we want countries to be able to bring into practice the Global Digital Compact. And last but not least, the IGF should continue and, sh and has to be strengthened. And its mandate should be extended to facilitate the operationalization of global digital cooperation, but also bring, bridge the gap between the liberative spaces and decision-making processes and serve as a, ser as a central space for multi-stakeholder engagement. Thanks, Valeria. Raul. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, I think that's the the the, um, the the global digital compact and the, the, in the summit of the future, we have to be very careful. Governments have to be very careful in creating new bureaucracies, and uh, that's make uh, much more difficult to participate for um, developing countries, small countries, as Nigel. Uh, point, pointed out the complexity of for participating in the global landscape for 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 a small uh, Carib for the Caribbean countries among others, but uh, also for for other stakeholders uh, that don't have the, the the power and the resources to participate in multiple processes. Uh, in in that sense, I I already say that IGF is, is the agenda of IGF is very aligned with the with the with the issues that uh, will be part of the 
of, of, of the GDC, so we have to work in strengthening the IGF. Of, of course, the IGF has to continue evolving to accompany the evolution of the challenges, uh, but uh, this is a, it's a good venue. It's a venue that has been very useful for, for everybody. And uh, uh, UN has a, an important role in promoting the participation of more governments in, in the multi-stakeholder mechanisms. And it's uh, undoubtedly UN is the, the organization that is uh, best positioned for, 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 for doing that. And I think that we have to take uh, uh, governments out of their com the comfort zone. At the end of the day, the, the, this will be conditioned by the intergovernmental decisions. The decisions will be by, by the governments. And, uh, so the, we have to make them to have to help them to resist the temptation to increase uh, governmental uh, control or, or oversight in, uh, in, in in digital governance. But we don't need more 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 governmental control. We need more multi-stakeholderism. The the issues are so complex that the only way to deal with the, the challenges that mm -hmm. we have is the, with full participation of of all stakeholders. All, all stakeholders, and this is why we have to be there. This is uh, why we have to participate in this process, and we need more participation of all the stakeholders to be disrupt mm -hmm. disruptive and to, as I said before, to, to take uh, governments out of their comfort zone. Thanks, Raul. Bitange. I think there is convergence in uh, thought. Um, we had a session on uh, declaration of the future of internet, which almost a similar uh, issues enabling uh, the uh, freedom and um, taking care of every individual with respect to human rights. And I think they're here. If we are able to, to look at such convergences and a little more widely, we can be able to encompass or respond to all the questions that have been asked. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bitange. Paul. Thanks, Henriette. Um, I heard uh, <clears throat> quite a lot of questions and um, quite a lot of questions about inclusivity. Um, most of the questions were about in inclusion, I think, about uh, marginalized individuals and communities and small islands and youth and gender and homeless and children and, and others. And I also heard about inclusion uh, in the internet, in internet governance, and in the GDC process, so that's a lot of a lot of inclusion that's being uh, being asked about there. And I think the quest, but the the, the the fact that the questions that were asked can be asked here in this room and can be asked by the people who are directly concerned uh, with those issues is is a hint at the power of um, of this model, of the IGF model. So this is um, this is the IGF. It's not the GDC or the Summit for the Future, but but I do think the answers to those questions of inclusion across the board are potentially in this room because what's what's happening here and what's happened here for 18 years, uh, if not perfect, and no one has said it said it is, uh, can still absolutely provide the the venue and the framework for what GDC apparently needs for follow up of actions and objectives and reviews, and so on. Whether that's by um, by expanding the remit of the IGF or by, by replicating somehow, certainly by evolving it. But, but I really think the answers are here and do not need to be, to be replicated. I mean, we've got this multi-stakeholder community here that's, that's ready, that, that wants to talk about strengthening and has done for, for um, quite a period of time. Um, Eurodig, uh, we heard, has called for it. Henriette said it, um, we're ready for this, we're looking for an opportunity for the IGF to, to provide its worth, uh, to do its work um, better and further to ex to, and for us to exploit the potential that's here in this, in this room, uh, the potential of, of the process and the people and, and the, community, uh, the communities that are involved. Uh, so I think um, that's where I would uh, like to see the future, as I say, not as a reinvention not as a rearrangement of, of deck chairs, but, but really as a way to just simply move forward and, and make things uh, continually uh, better. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. I think we have time for three short interventions from the audience, be it online or be it here. I see Jeanette coming forward again. Now we have time. 
So, and and please. can we check with Amrita because my connection has dropped. Amrita, if there are if there's an online, maybe just read it. Good. Please, Janet. Janet Hofmann, um, professor for internet politics uh, in Berlin, Germany. A lot of uh, the issues that were addressed um, so far seem to be covered more or less by the IGF. So in a way, I think I echo Paul Wilson's point about how the IGF and the Global Compact will actually be related to each other. We talked a lot about internet fragmentation. We also need to worry about fragmentation and internet governance. Thank you so much, Jeanette. And please, we have to close the lines. We have the gentleman there to my left. Please yeah, introduce thank, yourself. Thank you, Pons Lloyd, um, Gambia NRI. I would like to get the opinion of the panel. Um, we in the Gambia, when we did our GDC consultation process, um, we involved all stakeholders, including the government, um, in doing the submission. So I would like to know how you feel about that process, because we felt it was necessary to get our government inputs. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we go to my right. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for the panel. My name is Laura Pereira. I'm a youth delegate from Brazil. Uh, my question is, I believe that the, the critics that were resonated in the panel uh, are a reflection of how, how the label of multi-stakeholderism has been applied to multilateral process or to process in general. As a, as a synonym of cons public consultation. As we know, as a community in internet governance, that the multi-stakeholder um, model must be more than that, however hard it is to th theorize and put a fiction in into practice, to quote <laughs> Hoffman here. Uh, don't we, is it possible for us, for us to, to use the GDC model and choose the IGF, IGF opportunity to set an updated, uh, updated standards uh, to allow the use of the multi-stakeholder as a label uh, to the process. Can we, can we de develop update, updated standards uh, to classify a process as multi-stakeholder or not multi-stakeholder? Isn't that the agenda for all of, all of us here at the IGF? Thank you all. Thank you so much. We had... Hello, there. my name is Chad Garcia Ramelo from APC. I have a question for Amandeep. Um, two things. Uh, what would you see as a, a scenario of a failure for GDC? Um, and on the other hand, what would you see as success, like two years from now? Thank you. Very concrete questions. And we have Amrita, please, from the online yeah, online, online comment from William Drake. He says he agrees with Raul. We don't need a new bureaucracies on a new digital cooperation forum that competes with the IGF for resources and attention. We need to renew the IGF's mandate and strengthen the process. This point has been made repeatedly throughout the GDC process. Thank you, Amrita. And very shortly, the gentleman there to my left. Very shortly, please, go. Very short. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. We discuss a lot about the content of the global compact, digital compact, as well as the partnership. But what about the accountability mechanism after having the law or compact? Because we agree on many things, but the implementation part is always poor, especially the developed countries are not responsible to the developing countries to build their capacity for the smooth implementation of those compacts so that how the UN system and the other agencies would be responsible and accountable in, the, in, in this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for keeping it short. Very important point. And in the interest of time, we have to go already to your final takeaways. If you can react there very shortly, in one minute, each of you, to what has been said now in this last round. I would uh, begin with Paul, please. 
I've, I've said before that the internet deserves a Nobel Prize for how it served humanity during COVID. Um, and I'm really inspired by the, by the plea by um, Valeria, actually, which was to recognise real issues facing humanity. And I think COVID was a fantastic example of a real issue addressed actually not just by the internet, but by the digital capacities of the world, medical science, for instance, in a major, major way. And I really think that these, there are other non-digital issues which are, are pending right now. They're existential for humanity, for communities and for humanity. And uh, those non-digital issues need to be addressed. If they're not, if, if digital issues only are going to occupy us, then let's be sure, as I said, I think third time, not just rearranging deck chairs, but building on what we have on the innovations here in this venue and around the world to produce real non-digital outcomes, because that's what the planet actually needs right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bitang. I think we have a real chance of uh, coming up with a guiding framework for, for policymakers, government, uh, and other stakeholders. Um, this is the time uh, to do it uh, because we have seen the importance of this, um, of the internet. Uh, we need to create a future that is more inclusive. We need to create a future that enables innova innovative programs to come upon, but we must get um, a chance to deliberate those issues like we are doing right now. I can, as a po formerly a policymaker, I benefited from uh, discussing with the stakeholders, the civil society, uh, it worked. Uh, but most governments sometimes uh, push aside uh, civil society into a, to their discussions. But as you can see, there, there is so much we can learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. Raul. Thank you, Jorge. Um, I, the, Every act, every stakeholder have a, a, has a, a huge responsibility in this uh, in this era, on these topics, uh, and governments have a huge responsibility in uh, in accelerating innovation, in uh, in creating enabling environments uh, for for building uh, new, um, more uh, inclusive and equitable uh, development models, and. Uh, really creating avenues for, for uh, making that the technology impact in a positive manner in the, in the life of everybody in the world. So the, uh, this is a, a good opportunity for in the, this discussion to, uh, to reinforce uh, that. Uh, with regard to the process, it's clear that we need uh, more opportunities of participation for stakeholders uh, in, the, in the process toward the summit of the future and the adoption of the global uh, uh, digital compact. And of course, I echo everybody's uh, comments in, with regard to the need to strengthen IGF and keeping IGF as the central venue for dealing with those issues uh, after the, the, the summit of the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Raul. Valeria. Thank you. I think we are all aware of the injustices of the current order, and we know the problem diagnosis already, so we also recognize the inordinate power held by the few that control policy spaces. The silent consensus that we cannot regulate big tech has to be challenged. We need a political commitment and we need uh, member states to measure up. Uh, global digital governance, including a uh, global regime for data governance, should set the conditions for equity and for fairness. In the way, and in that way, um, benefit the, the everyone should benefit from the digitalization and ensure that those benefits are distributed to ensure a dignified life for everyone. And uh, any institutional arrangement decided in the framework of the Global Digital Compact must not walk the path uh, of reinforcing the current in unjust order. What we seek and what we need is a feminist, sustainable and transformative vision uh, for a digital future that is really and truly open, free and secure. Thank you, Valeria. Amandeep, you have the last takeaway. Thank you. Uh, I I like the last point uh, someone made about accountability. I think there's no doubt that the challenges are such that we need more action by more people. Uh, I think on that we can all agree. So 
the current level of action, the current level of response is not adequate. So we need to go to the next level. And it's also important that we have accountability and we have uh, justice in terms of the governance, that the entry barriers to participation in the governance discussions are lower. And the point made by uh, Raul about smaller delegations, uh, there are 160 plus countries who shouldn't be running from forum to forum and then figuring out what a whole of government perspective on digital uh, looks like. So we need to make that task easier and make sure that people have agency over the digital transformation. Only a few countries, only a few corporations have the resources to engage on digital issues in multiple forums. So there is a fragmented landscape already. What we need to do is plug the gaps, just as in the Secretary General's policy brief, you see with that infographic, critical gaps on misinformation, disinformation, uh, the accountability for uh, human rights, the issue of AI uh, governance, and there are ongoing initiatives like the IGF leadership panel to strengthen the IGF and Thank plug you. that gap. So that's Amen. what we need uh, today. And if you allow me a few seconds on the success of failure, seconds. just in one sentence, uh, the failure is if we don't use the opportunity of the summit of the future, to raise the level of ambition, raise the level of activity, raise the level of coherence across our responses. Success is exactly the opposite. So we have to rise to that challenge. Thank you, Amandeep. And I think really this community is up to that challenge. And uh, thank you so much for being able to profiting from picking your brains, picking the brains of the audience, both here physically and uh, online. And Henriette, please. Thanks. There isn't really time for closing remarks, but very briefly, I think when it comes to process, we have to abandon complacency. There's, there's, there's a need for improving governance, um, for more accountability, as, as has just been said. We need that within this multi-stakeholder process. We need it within the multilateral. We also need more cooperation within each of these and between them. So let's do this evolution and improvement together. On content, I think what, what is really challenging, but the G GDC has put that into focus, is navigating the specificity of internet development and, and growth and governance, but also how it intersects with broader governance issues. We need to do both, and I think the GDC and the Summit of the Future and the link with the SDGs is putting that into focus. It's not easy, and we can do it, and the IGF is a very important part of that. I think in terms of follow-up, I just want to bring to, to, to us a, a phrase from the WISIS outcome documents, enabling environment. If you read the WISIS outcome documents, that's how it describes the role of governments, to create an enabling environment for people-centered development, human rights, um, and, and, and inclusion. So I think let's keep that in mind, that it's not just about the topics that we are discussing specifically in the GDC. It's creating an enabling environment for, for not just dealing with current challenges, but also uh, emerging challenges. So thanks to everyone for very good input, excellent panel, and apologies to online participants if we did not give you enough space. And to the MAG who organized this. Thanks a lot.